Okay, good evening. This is Ms. John Crofts, and uh, I put together this package that I call uh, Cummins Engines from a Fuel Systems Perspective. And uh, the goal is to kind of give a overview of the origins of the, the engine families that we have. Um, I guess just to introduce myself a little bit. Um, I've been with Cummins my entire career. I grew up in Columbus, Indiana, and uh, the first several years I worked in the uh, engine group. Um, last 25 years I've been in fuel systems, and I'm currently working on XPI pump <coughs> development. Um, the pictures you see here on this slide, I guess, are to give a little background of how I ended up at Cummins. Uh, that's actually a photograph of my father on the right, and uh, he he was born and raised in England, and uh, after building Merlin aircraft engines during World War II, he immigrated to Southern Africa and uh, was installing engine irrigation systems for Rolls-Royce and MWM, and uh, but he was aware of Cummins. The NH engine had a very good reputation there. He used to say if a customer ever had an NH, they weren't interested in anyone else's engine. And so in the photograph there, the race car was taken in front of a, a lot of engine blocks here at Plant One. I actually co-opted in that department uh, in 1978. He had also, of course, kept up with the, uh, the trade magazines and so I think in Diesel Progress, they, they noted how Cummins had put a diesel-powered race car on the pole position at Indianapolis. So I think the, both of these things made a big impression on my father. And uh, we immigrated to the U.S. in 62, and then by 1965, he had joined Cummins Engine Company, and I was five years old, and we moved to Columbus. So that's, that's sort of the origin. Now, the photograph of him in a test cell, that is a hyperbar project where we were trying to extract huge horsepowers out of our current KV series engines back in the, I suppose that was in the 80s, and it wasn't such a great, great idea. This was in France, and uh, so a friend of ours uh, found this photograph recently and forwarded it to me, and. Uh, and he thought, my dad was an application engineer, and he thought that he must be shaking his head at what in the world were people trying to do with this engine, and was it really suitable for applications. And it, that program died, <laughs> needless to say. Okay, I'll, also in this training, I kind of want to give a, the origins of the, the engine company and the fuel systems, and a little bit about Clessy. Um, I, I take some of my information from this book, The Diesel Odyssey of Plessy Cummins, and it was written by Lyle Cummins, the youngest son of Plessy. And he's actually written several books. Uh, you can go back and find these in the notes of these slides if, if you're interested. Okay, I'd like to start here where in 1912, uh, Plessy needed a diversion in his life, and he decided to take his little home-built boat that had a four-horsepower gasoline-powered engine. He was going to take it down the rivers of the U.S. all the way to New Orleans uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, on this trip, they found it very difficult to find gasoline, but there was plenty of kerosene, as that's how people lit their homes. And so I think this made a big impression on Clessy that what the world needed or what the U.S. needed was a simple little engine that would burn kerosene. And so then a few years later he had uh, developed a, a machine shop business. Uh, and again, the, much more of this history is, uh, is in this book. But anyway, he as you probably know, he was the chauffeur for the local banker in Columbus. 
and the bankers sponsored his, some of his enterprises. So uh, by 1917, he had this machine shop going, and he was still interested, greatly interested in engines. In fact, he was uh, machining fuel pumps. Uh, oops, I need to go back. Yeah, I can go. Yeah. Okay, well, so yeah, he had this mach machine shop going by 1917 uh, and not yet started the engine business. Okay, just for a little background then, um, the early diesels, actually the ones like Rudolf diesel, uh, when he finally got the engine working, the injection system that was was uh, arrived at was an air blast injection. So what I'm showing in this slide is not the engine, but the fuel system. So on the right, uh, that's actually a compressor, and sometimes these were st three-stage compressors. With intercoolers between the stages and really only suitable for large uh, stationary engines or I'll use the Yeah, it's visible now. Okay, yeah, as I was saying, that um, diesel engines in the early days then uh, needed a very large and complicated and expensive fuel system. And so that sort of limited diesel applications to, uh, to large uh, stationary or, or marine type use. Um, so there were some other ideas to to use a, a simple fuel system, and one was uh, was being marketed in the U.S. under the Veed uh, patent, and this actually used the Braun system uh, out of Europe. And Clessy was very still very interested in engines, uh, even when he just had the machine shop. And there was a company in southern Indiana, in Evansville, Indiana, that uh, Hercules Engines. And they were a, a licensee, one of several licensees of this bead um, patent and, and engine design. And so the, class, the Cummins Machine Works, their first involvement with it was to make the fuel injector for, uh, for this other company. And so I'm showing a picture of that injector, and it's basically a low, low pressure system. Fuel is just metered in uh, into a kind of a pre cup, not really a pre chamber, just it, just with gravity. And uh, and then the way it worked was, and you can kind of see the diagram there. So the very cup at the bottom is. You can kind of see that pictorially in, in figure one. So you metered in some fuel. And then the heat of compression then comes in the spray holes from the cylinder. And that starts to evaporate the fuel and you get some, some evaporation of the light components of the fuel. And then it actually starts burning in the cup. And the burning in the cup then, that's what propels the fuel into the main combustion chamber. Now the problem with this system is that there's uh, really no way to control timing. But it was simple and it, it would work for, uh, for smaller engines uh, at a low cost. So eventually Clessy convinced uh, the banker, uh, W.G. Irwin, to back an engine works and they also started building these bead engines under license. So that was the 1919 start of Cummins engines. Again, this was just a licensed uh, design. Now, it wasn't long before Clessy started making improvements, and so you can see this. There's a diagram of a patent, and one of the problems was that um, 
the fuel supply would get aerated uh, from the combustion gases. So he devised a, uh, a return circuit, a, a flow-through circuit. And years later, when the PT system was developed, he basically applied the same principle. Okay, so I guess the point is is that um, that Clessy Cummins was really the the fuel systems developer for Cummins. Uh, he was involved with some engine design as well, but his main contribution really was uh, was to fuel systems, and that that's kind of my point here. And uh, I think we've kind of covered this uh, that really for automotive diesels, uh, you know, the requirements for a fuel injection were were quite demanding, and and Clessy took a kind of a different course from the uh, from the rest of the industry, and that really had set Cummins engines apart. Uh, really, until quite recently, we've we've really kind of used, in my mind, um, an evolution of of Clessy's fundamental designs. And, and I'm talking about the HPI system that we used on North American uh, EPA Automotive through 2010. Okay, again, this some early history here. So, Clessy wanted to improve, you know, do away with this bead system that you really couldn't control timing with, and so he felt there needed to be a, you know, a timing valve. And even in 1922, he started having ideas that sort of showed this plunger injector. Um. So in the in the history book, uh, it mentions that Clessy and this uh, Hans Knudsen, who was a, a key early Cummins employee, um, it, they tested nearly 3,000 separate fuel injection variations before they really settled on the current uh, the current plunger design that we were familiar with and this is kind of the latest evolution of the the Cummins PT what we now call the PT but it's the plunger injector open nozzle plunger injector now there are other training courses on theory of operation for most of the Cummins fuel systems so it's not really my intention to go through the theory but if there's any questions along the way uh, you know I Please speak up. Okay, so in addition to the this plunge, open nozzle plunger injector, then there over the years there were lots of different schemes uh, developed on how to meter the fuel into these injectors. Uh, so this just shows some of the evolution. That there was a single disc pump that was used for a long time. And then kind of an ill-fated double disc pump, which really did wasn't a success. And then uh, this shows the earliest PT pump. And this is just a schematic, if you will, of uh, of today's uh, PT pump with the enhancements needed for, for instance, the AFC is the air fuel control for turbocharged engines. So kind of the final evolution of the basic PT system. Um, there were some concepts beyond the PT system, and I just want to kind of point those out. Uh, Clessy's mind really never stopped, and so he he thought of lots of different ways and uh, of, of metering fuel systems. Um, and he, he left Cummins, uh, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think, I think in the, in the, I guess in the 50s he actually left Cummins, but he continued to do development, and uh, there was some kind of hard times between Clessy and the engine company, uh, 
I'm showing Nev Reiners. He, he comes up as a kind of a character that convinced the management or the banker and then his nephew uh, Erwin Miller that they didn't need all of Clessy's ideas. They, they had their own ideas now. And so there was some controversy over who really had the patent for the PTG system and that. And again, this is all in that uh, the book, The Diesel Odyssey, if, if you're interested in more information. Um, as I mentioned, even after the PT system basically was being used by Cummins or being developed, uh, Plessy had this idea for a positive displacement metering. And so the pump shown there is actually made by uh, American Bosch, and it was finally released in around 1970. And that's when, about the time that picture was taken. And that's Clessy on the left, and then his son Lyle on the right. And uh, this was after now the the Jacobs engine brake, which was also a, a product of Clessy. And again. Uh, Cummins Engine Company was not interested in it. I think it was really Nev Reiners that said, no, we don't need Plessy's uh, engine brake. Um, we have some of our own ideas. But as, as it turned out, the Plessy's was really the, the superior idea. And he, he got this Jacobs Manufacturing to put that in production. So this, uh, what they called a hydrometer pump, was developed after the success of the successful launch of the engine brake company. And the reason I just mentioned that is that even though that was not a commercial success, by the time they released this, the, the engine company had the PT system working well enough that there was really no aftermarket for pumps. But the engine company bought several of these and benchmarked them. And uh, actually, the little diagram there, that was drawn up by Harry Wilson, uh, who I worked for on, on the SELECT program, and now his son Mark Wilson is, uh, is leading a lot of the fuel systems engineering here. So there was some benchmarking done, and they basically learned how to TP meter through this, uh, through studying Plessy's uh, latest pump, and then this sort of led to the HPI TP metering. So. I would like to think that even through 2010, uh, our fuel system still went back to some of Clessy's ideas. Okay, I'm going to switch gears here a little bit, and now we'll start to talk about the engine models uh, in the history. And again, there's quite a bit of kind of history here, not so relevant to today's products, but uh, anyway, I'd like to take you through it. So this is. The Model F in 1924, and this would have had the first Cummins uh, plunger injector. I think this was actually a multi-plunger pump. This is before the single-disc distributor pump. And, of course, they had one, two, three, and four cylinder versions of this. But you can see the a lot of the mechanical components, the valve train and that, were all exposed. And so they had trouble in uh, some of their applications with, with dirt. Uh, the Model U, I think, really kind of got Cummins going. The, everything was enclosed. Uh, and again, they had different cylinder models. And then this shows a schematic of the fuel system. Again, the, the early Cummins plunger injector. But now they had a, the single disc pump. It was a distributor pump. So just one plunger. And you could, so once you set the fueling by adjusting the uh, the cam train uh, linkage, then you would use that same shot of fuel and just distribute it to the various cylinders. So the the cylinder the cylinder balance was was a bit easier to deal with. Then there's some larger ones, uh, K and L. Now these are nothing to do with today's K series and the L10 and that these were they recycled the model letters um, and then what really set the real automotive engine then 
was the uh, age. And I understand when it was first released, it was actually a failure. Uh, the crankshaft was undersized and uh, they had problems, so they it quickly redesigned the crankshaft and, and went from three and a quarter to four and a half uh, bearing diameter on the main bearings. And so I think that this actually helped in that the basic dimensions then lasted all the way up through the 1991. Uh, for the H and NH and NT family and really not until the 91 uh, N14 did the, the any of the major dimensions get increased again so the HB I guess was the, the larger bearing and you can see that that's got a single disc pump on it uh, but again it was the Cummins plunger injector and this is this, probably these engines and, and even with the PT system, that's what would have been in Southern Africa that uh, my father was competing with. And it did so well with their uh, the fuel supply they had available there. There's a lot of water got in the fuel. Uh, they also made a smaller engine, uh, the Model A, and then it became the C, and then later the C and J. And... Uh, and it wasn't really as successful as the uh, as the N and NH family. Um, I guess at, at one time, the textbook at when the PT system was still new and they were just starting to do turbochargers, going away from superchargers to turbochargers. Uh, sometimes the customers, and I suppose even some of our own distributors, would uh, would refer to it as the the C and J with the PT or part-time fuel system and a trouble charger. So, uh, I guess we had our ups and downs. Um, then the NH uh, was kind of a major improvement. They went to a four-valve head. Uh, and this shows a lot of the variation. And you can just see the horsepower and the years as they go on. And also... Uh, the engine on the lower photograph here is uh, is a V12. So uh, they basically took two of the H's or NH's and uh, made a V12. And that's I believe that is, is our, our 1710 or 28 liter. And I and I believe that there's some of those still being made, maybe in any of them. But uh, that's the origins of uh, of that engine. Now the cylinder heads are different. That had uh, cylinder heads that covered three cylinders and of course I guess the cylinder spacing had to change for the V configuration but that's the origin of that engine back in 1949. Uh, still evolution of the same basic engine, the NTC uh, highly turbocharged and after cooled um, around 1972 and I just wanted to point out now that we're needing some more functionality out of the fuel system. So it was they had a uh, aneroid, I guess, or it was basically a way of limiting the fuel until the turbocharger boost had uh, built up. Of course, now that's incorporated in the PT pump as the AFC, but originally that was a remote device. I think these things were kind of easy for the some owner operators to defeat. The story was they'd unhooked that little line that went to the intake manifold, put a grease fitting in the top of the aneroid, and I think they even did this on the AFC pump, and then just pump the pump it full of grease with a grease gun, and they'd get full fuel all the time. They didn't care about the smoke and the durability uh, shortcomings. They wanted the power. Um, with the introduction of emissions regulations and the first in the US was 1980 for California um, we no longer could uh, meet the requirements with only controlling uh, fuel quantity we really needed to take control of, uh, of another dimension uh, fuel timing so the first attempt that we put in production was this uh, mechanical variable timing and this worked on the NH family by 
having two positions that the uh, cam followers could be in, uh, an advanced and retarded. And so that, that's what you're seeing there is kind of a exploded view of, a, of an NH or an MT cam follower with an actuator. And so this wasn't very durable. Uh, there was also development work done on a cam phaser. And I'm just showing uh, some sketches or cross sections of that. And the idea would be that you would control oil pressure into the this cam phaser that was built into the camshaft gear and again you get two positions advanced and retarded uh, this concept was never put in production uh, what we did go to then was uh, step time control STC and that I believe is still is in production on some of our products and so that's basically a hydraulic link it uses uh, engine oil and again it's basically got two positions since the step uh, name. It's either collapsed or pumped up. Okay, so that's that's kind of the uh, that engine model. We'll we'll get back into the the NH, but uh, by 1982, then we had uh, launched another engine family, the the L10, and this was originally designed as as a European truck engine. Um, but as it turned out, there was, with the oil embargo and that, there was a need in the U.S. for a, a smaller, more efficient uh, truck engine. And it was launched with the PT fuel system. Now the L has grown to the M, and, or to 11 liters, and we, we changed it from the L to the M. But it's the same basic platform. Okay, and uh, the first electronic control then was in 1988, and, and now we had emissions regulations for all 50 states here in the U.S., not just California. And actually, our intention was to launch a full authority system. We had uh, done an internal runoff kind of between the predecessor to... HPI, which again was a spin-off from Klesi's hydrometer system, but with the advent of timing control. So it was, uh, like I said, it was really the predecessor to HPI. And then there, there was another group, actually that was done by the advanced engineering group in the tech center. And fuel systems had been working with this Bendix patent that became Select. And uh, there was actually a kind of a runoff and an audit done between the two competing systems and the decision was made that for our heavy duty engines we would go with the Bendix patent uh, again which became select but when 1988 rolled around they realized it really wasn't ready for production and uh, now both our competitors at the time, Caterpillar and Detroit Diesel, were releasing full authority uh, electronic unit injectors, and we really needed to get our uh, service organization and our OEMs used to electronics. So what we did is basically kept the PT STC product, but we added some electronic controls. So we called that PACE. And you, I don't know if you can really see from the picture, but basically there's a PT fuel pump with this second story on top, and we took the Genset governor, the EFC actuator, and we put it in a separate module on top of the pump, and then we, uh, you can see on the right there is the ECM, the electronic control module. So we added some functionality. Uh, we still did the timing control with the hydromechanical STC. But we had uh, cruise control, we had a PTO governor, and this was, a, again, a good introduction for everyone to get used to sensors and control software and servicing electronic products. But uh, anyway, we, we kind of fell short. Um, and actually, the, 
the 88 NT and the 444 rating turned out to not be very successful and Cummins uh, lost a lot of market share over this and uh, but sometimes you know you can't be number one forever number two and three were trying very hard and uh, so the fortunes changed there for a while so then we did get the uh, select system working for a 1991 launch and the N NH engine, NT engine then became the N14 and as I mentioned the, there were some major engine changes on bearing size and other features to, to allow us to increase the horsepower. We also uh, were able to launch uh, the L10, convert the L10 to select as well. So this is the solenoid controlled uh, unit injector, one solenoid on every unit injector. Okay, we're going to change gears here a little bit um, and back up to 1961. Um, there was a direction at that time to go with uh, compact V engines and, uh, and my understanding is is that late in the late in the 60s or 70s you could walk through our tech center up and down all of the test cells and you could not find an inline engine there were nothing but V's, V6's and V8's and uh, so we had a line of, of sm small engines uh, the, or Again, they had PT fuel systems, and uh, and really until the launch of the Case Cummins B and C series, they were our, our small engines. Uh, this also uh, introduced the V903, which was launched as a truck engine, and some fleets really liked that engine and had good luck with it, um, but it never really replaced the inline six, and I think that's because the idea was that these these would be light and compact but not highly turbocharged and when high high rates of turbocharging came along you really needed the length of the longer crankshaft to get good bearing size so uh, we still have the 903 in production today but we only really sell that as a military engine and really all of the rest of the V's went by the wayside Um, here we show the introduction of the 903 on the left uh, from 1969 and today we're still making uh, the 903 and it has electronic, uh, electronically controlled SDC fuel system and the horsepower has gone up quite a bit okay the the K engine then that was released in 73 and that was originally intended for the heavy duty truck market and uh, again with the oil embargo coming on in the US uh, and fuel economy becoming such a priority it was short lived as a as a truck engine now my understanding is is that it was very popular in Australia where they had trailer trains so uh, so I think we kept the, probably the majority of the, these used as trucks ended up in that sort of application and the weight was so much that it, it wasn't really that desirable for a, for a typical line haul truck now part of that program was to make uh, V12s and V16s and that's where uh, really that whole engine family came from but it was originally launched like I said in 1973 as a as a truck engine and we still have a you know a version of that today the QSK 19 and as far as the fuel systems uh, there's really three choices on the K family I believe we're still selling the, the basic PT system hydromechanical 
Uh, we have a high horsepower version of HPI. Actually, that was the first HPI that we launched prior to the heavy duty uh, joint venture with Scania. And then for common rail, high pressure common rail, the corporation decided that we would not try and uh, do XPI for high horsepower. We were just developing XPI for heavy duty and our mid-range and we just didn't have the resources to do everything so we decided that we would go to Bosch and so this modular common rail system that's a Bosch system okay uh, I actually hired in uh, to the, the what was called the small engine program this was a joint venture with J.I. Case uh, and this was the that Ford van you see in the background. That was what really hooked me. Uh, I had been a co-op here and uh, worked with a, a manager, Jim Neal. And he, when I was graduating from Purdue, just up 100 miles up the road from Columbus, he said, John, what we need is uh, someone to put together a little pilot installation center. And our first project is we're going to go out and buy a Ford van, and we want to put one of these new Case Cummins 4B engines in it. And uh, I just couldn't resist. So that, that photograph there is the first pilot uh, vehicle of the B and C series. Now on the very left, barely in the picture, is Phil Jones and he in my mind he's an unsung hero at Cummins he he's the most successful engine architect chief engineer I think we've had most prolific he his first engine was the L10 his second engine was the K series and then his third and fourth were the B and C and so we still have that you know all of those products uh, now what he, he came from Perkins in England, he's an Englishman, and he felt that to really, for Cummins to introduce uh, a very successful launch, that we should not use a Cummins fuel system. And I think part of that reason was that uh, he felt for smaller engines, uh, unit injectors were too costly. And so, I've not, I didn't actually see him present this, but, but later on I, someone described this to me, so I kind of made this graph up. But what he presented to upper management was a graph like this that showed that uh, as engine displacement goes up, pump line nozzle systems have a fairly steep slope. And unit injectors have a flatter slope, but they start out higher. So he was able to convince... Cummins management that this new engine would not have a Cummins fuel system because we were to the left of that intersection and I I think it was a it was a good decision the B and C were probably the most successful launches we had up to that time And this shows kind of the early, the, the original version of the B. It's a 4B. Of course, you know we make a six-cylinder version as well. These are the two valve heads. And uh, Phil also pulled together a, a separate team to develop these engines. He basically toured the world and found people from other engine companies and, uh, and other uh, consulting companies. And actually, they set up a little tech center separate from Cummins Main, main Tech Center. And that's where I hired in. It was in Columbus. It was uh, METC, they called it, the Midrange Engine Tech Center. Again, it, originally it was the Case Cummins project. And so he was able to hire uh, probably the world's most knowledgeable uh, port expert, Nigel Gale, from Ricardo Consulting Engineers in England. And Nigel had been working on uh, swirl ports, uh, doing work as a consultant for Mercedes and some people like that. And then there was also a guy, Jean Nicolet, from uh, Berlier in France that knew a lot about 
port design. So between the two of them, we got some very effective port designs in the B and C series engine. And so the combustion system then was a high, had this high swirl intake port, and then the piston bowl was such that they had high squish. And so there was a, a bit more work done to the air, and so that meant you you could do less work to the fuel. So we were able to use distributor pumps on the B series at a very good cost advantage, and basically the the lowest pressure inline pumps on the C series. We were using an A pump back when our competitors were using a MW and P pump, a more expensive, higher pressure pump. Okay, now we could only go so long before uh, management felt we really wanted to get a Cummins fuel system on these mid-range engines. So in 1998, we launched the Cummins accumulator pump system on the ISC and kind of the idea behind this was uh, of course we'd had now control over fueling from the very beginning and control over timing starting kind of in 1980 but until that time you, we really had no control over pressure you know as an independent variable pressure would vary but it varied with speed and with the fueling and you once you designed kind of the stiffness of the system uh, you really had no control over it. you kind of got what what the system gave you so with the common rail coming on now you had another lever you had uh, you had control over pressure now the volumes are higher on these mid-range engines and so I think this Cummins accumulator pump system or CAPS uh, was attractive to, to Cummins. They felt that, look, we can do one electronic control valve per engine and one pump per engine with this system, and we'll just continue to buy the low cost nozzles that were really kind of a commodity by then, either from Bosch or, or one of the other fuel system suppliers. So it's kind of a novel idea. And by at this time, Common rail was still in its infancy, and uh, there was a lot of concern over, you know, the liability of having a rail full of fuel that could just go into one cylinder, and uh, in the cost. So this was sort of a bridge product, I guess it. It got us on our mid-range engines, and uh, we could see the benefit of independent pressure control, but. It wasn't, as it turned out, it, it had a, a lot of teething troubles, and uh, again, our customers weren't so pleased. Uh, in fact, they kind of joked that uh, they renamed it. They came up with an acronym of uh, Cummins Rotary Accumulator Pump. So, uh, now, there was, uh, again, a little comp internal competition going on. The select folks... Well, you know, why invent this new pump when you can basically take the inject or the select actuators and package them on an inline pump? And uh, so this was demonstrated, but it was not selected. Again, you didn't have really independent control of pressure, even though you'd have full authority control of fueling and timing. So what you see there is on the left is the big Bosch P pump, <coughs> and then uh, a couple of developmental levels of this select inline pump but again it was not uh, it's not pursued for production it's just demonstrated okay CCR now is uh, the Cummins common rail and uh, when we first started working on a, a, a Cummins common rail system which became XPI uh, by 2003, we weren't really ready to launch the full system. The injector development still needed some work, so we released a hybrid system. So it was our pump, and, and we basically took the CAPS pump and got rid of the, the brick on top, the injection control valve, and the distributor, and uh, came up with a new uh, metering system. We used the passive inlet and outlet check valves and went to this inlet metering valve. 
So this was a Cummins pump, Cummins ECM and controls, but we still purchased uh, the injectors, or we, we purchased the common rail injectors from Bosch, and I believe it was a Bosch rail and, and some other components. Okay, so again, I'm kind of changing gears here. Um, just want to point out kind of the engine families. This is a slide I borrowed from another presentation. So you can see the B 3.9, B 5.9, and the C 8.3 and L 8.9. Those are basically the mid-range engines that came out of this Case Cummins uh, joint venture. And on the bottom row, we add to that with the ISF, a 2.8 and a 3.8. So these are new uh, new engines, and I, I believe those use Bosch Common Rail now. Uh, they probably had hydromechanical systems before that. And I'm not so familiar with really the origins of those designs. I believe the ISF 3.8 is loosely based on our 3.9. Um, maybe some of you did some work on these engines. Um, I just wanted to point that out with this slide. Okay, um, the order of this presentation I struggled with, so that maybe feel like I'm jumping around, and I apologize for that. I'm I'm planning to kind of enhance this with more of a, a timeline at some point, but I just don't have that ready. What I show here is um, some prototype mid-range engines. These were B's, and we actually had a C as well. And these were designed to use the HPI system. And this really predates the CAPS days. And uh, so the engines were converted to an overhead cam unit injector design, I believe a four valve head, and uh, the idea was that they would have enough commonality that they could go down the same machining lines or manufacturing lines as the current uh, B and C engines. But these, again, never went to production. But I think the design team, and the, especially the Tom Stover there, the, the third from the right in the back row, I think he had uh, some input then on the ISX engine, and I think he tried out his ideas then on this BLX. So this is just a little behind the scenes development history for you. Okay, so the what I'm showing here now is the signature engine or the ISX, what we know now as the ISX. And uh, by the way, there's a the new Cummins uh, history, the red, black, and gold, and I've, I've been reading that. That just came out uh, at the end of last year. And so they discussed this history a little bit. But there was sort of this unspoken rule at Cummins that you should never introduce a new engine design and a new fuel system design at the same time. So we were wanting to replace the, or, you know, get another the more modern engine to finally replace the long-running N H and N series. Uh, that architecture was just basically limited. Uh, cylinder pressure was limited, and, and we really had nowhere to go. So we needed a more modern, higher cylinder pressure capable engine. And uh, so the ISX or Signature originally was designed around. Uh, uh, a stretch select. So you can see the date on that that, that uh, cross section was 1993 and I was actually in that group but the advanced engineering group that had been doing the HPI work and, and again by this time they had launched HPI on our high horsepower product they had convinced Scania to uh, to use to you know, to do a HPI program for their heavy-duty truck engine. Well, then Scania came to learn that we were developing a new uh, a new engine, 
but it wasn't using HPI. Well, they felt that in order for Cummins to really be committed to this HPI program, that we had to use it and launch it, you know, at the same time or sooner that they were than they were going to use it. So then the project switched from using a stretched higher pressure capability select to this uh, to a, a heavy duty size HPI. And then once Scania started testing some HPI, it was PT metered like the high horsepower. Well, they felt that this metering delay of PT metering was uh, was not good enough for uh, really for a modern heavy duty engine. So we were able to on the inline sixes we were able to basically revive this uh, TP metering concept that Plessy had laid out on his hydrometer system that basically says if you divide the front three cylinders and the rear three cylinders you just need to send pulses of fuel to either bank and then the, the injectors will act like the second stage distributor and, and you'll only have one metering window open of those three injectors and uh, so that's that's really what the TP metered HPI system has and again there's other training courses that describe the theory of operation. So this this shows uh, the two engines then now that use the heavy duty HPI TP. It's just a picture of the injector and then this IFSM and the integrated fuel system module. And I think that sort of fuel system module and the, again the engine layout was sort of a, a copy from this BLX and CLX idea. And again you can see there's a and the IFSM, the two actuators on the left, there's a timing and fueling actuator for the for maybe the rear three and then the ones on the right are for the front three or vice versa. Okay, then in 2006 we had our own common rail injector ready for production and so this became the uh, XPI, and by this time, uh, Scania had felt that the HPI joint venture had been a success. I believe that was a 30%, 70% uh, partnership with Cummins being the majority, and this was just for the manufacturing portion. <clears throat> now, on HPI, Scania kept to their goal of dual sourcing. So at that time they they had Bosch unit injectors and Cummins HPI unit injectors and they some engines used one and some used the other and they could sort of play this against the two suppliers for cost and performance and durability and so this was their plan on common rail so when they uh, decided that common rail was the right answer for heavy duty engines as well and Cummins was looking for a partner to do this project. Um, they were planning, they were evaluating both the XPI and Bosch's uh, APCRS, their uh, amplified uh, common rail system. And the XPI results were much better. And so uh, I believe it was a, a guy, Lars Tegnelius. Uh, a Scania engineer that was able to convince Scania's top management to not dual source. And the way they approached this was that if they could more fully participate, not only in the manufacturing but in the development, then they would commit 100% to this uh, XPI fuel system. And so that's what happened. And so we have a, now a full 50-50 joint venture on development and manufacturing. And we've had a lot of Scania engineers uh, come in and rotate for two or three years here. And we've had a few 
Cummins engineers go to Scania, kind of as this exchange. And uh, so that's the story behind the XPI fuel system. Uh, just point out, you know, what engines it's used on. The 11.9-liter uh, engine uh, might just discuss that. Again, it's it's mentioned in this uh, re most recent book, The Red, Black, and, Go uh, and Global. I may have called it the wrong name the first time. But, um, this was actually going to be a replacement for the L10 and M11, about a 12-liter engine, and it was codenamed Dakota. And, of course, it was going to use the heavy-duty HBI fuel system. And uh, I think this was around 2000, the year 2000, when uh, the economy and Cummins' fortunes weren't so good. And uh, in order to keep the business healthy, uh, the new management kind of took a bold step of, of canceling an engine program. And they had, there's really never been a, a real new engine that's ever been canceled, and certainly not in recent history. But this uh, Dakota project was was basically mothballed. I think some of the assembly equipment was sent to our Jamestown engine plant here and and, and used when we consolidated heavy duty engine assembly there. But it was revived then recently and launched uh, with the XPI fuel system. The engine then was kind of revived or redesigned to use uh, XPI. So now we call it the, you know, we still call it an ISX, but it's actually a new engine platform. It's uh, it's not common architect with the architecture with the 15 liter. Okay, now moving to the high horsepower again. These are slides borrowed from some of the high ho horsepower area, and I'll go through them fairly quick. This one has a HPI fuel system. And again, I mentioned I think the KVs have uh, PT, HPI, and the Bosch common rail. Now the QST30, this is a kind of a non, what I would call a non Cummins origin engine. This came out of our joint venture with Komatsu where they built some of our engines under license and then as part of the agreement we got rid of the 28 liter uh, V12 at least in the in the US at our Seymour Indiana plant and we replaced it with this 30 liter ba Komatsu based design and the original engine used a pump line nozzle system but it actually used two of them, two six-cylinder systems. And these were Denso pump line nozzle systems. And, and now with common rail, they've been upgraded to Denso common rail. Now, of course, the controls and the <coughs> sensors and all of that, those are all done by Cummins, and that's common with, with our complete product line. But the fuel system is, is a Denso. Now this goes back to a, a K series based engine. Again, this is based on that original sort of truck engine. These have grown over the years, and like I said, been joint ventures with with Komatsu on some of the some of the designs. Sixteen liter version, fifty liter. And then kind of a stretched, I think, the largest displacement version, increased displacement, displacement is this QSK 78 liter. And that's a 18 cylinder. <laughs> right, right. And just some slides from, from uh, high horsepower presentations showing some applications here. Won't spend much time here. Okay, now, as you 
hopefully no, Cummins has just announced uh, a new engine platform and th this is a clean sheet of paper, the Hedgehog and uh, HPI is competing with uh, with Bosch for uh, to be the fuel system on this engine and I'm not sure if that decision has been okay next yeah sounds like next week we should hear and uh, if it's XPI we are developing an injector but not a pump we would use uh, I think the same pump that uh, well no actually that it would be a Woodward uh, pump they have a, a line of high horsepower pumps and again we're just we feel our organization and our manufacturing is is not in the position to develop a new large uh, family of pumps so at least for launch we would we would purchase the pump but we would manufacture the injectors but it, it may it may go with Bosch injectors we'll find out next month and uh, I guess just to kind of in closing I think my you know my father didn't think that at least from an application standpoint this uh, hyperbar, this highly boosted version of our K engine made a lot of sense. And uh, he passed away a couple of years ago and I think he would have been very pleased to see that Cummins now has a, a big displacement engine. So that's really how, that's how I close the presentation. I've got a couple more slides here just showing where all of the current engines are produced and just kind of a little uh, history of some of the stuff again I'd like to I'm planning to try and get a an actual timeline put together that shows this more pictorially okay when I gave the training here in Columbus we had a, a quiz and some prizes but we can try that here if you want so number one uh, so why was being able to advance injection timing at light load so important when the real reason, you know, we needed to retard timing to meet emissions and it was the NOx emission regulations that forced us to retard timing to lower the combustion temperatures. So why couldn't we just change the fixed timing? Why did we have to have two timings when we started retarding timing at high load. Does, it, does anyone want to take a stab at that answer? Okay, it's because at light load, at startup, the timing was so advanced that, um, or it was so retarded and the combustion was so cooler that we had horrible white smoke problems. And, and this was kind of actually limiting us from switching from uh, coolant after cooling to air to air like the rest of the industry was and that I think that was part of the reason why the 1988 uh, 444 and those engines were were so troublesome is that we were we were trying to use coolant as the after cooling so we could preheat the intake air in cold weather and I had a little uh, YouTube video that showed a trucks of this era starting up in the cold weather and the clouds of white smoke that were coming out in the, and I, I can remember seeing that you'd go by a truck stop or something and just see clouds of white smoke from these engines that had retarded timing but couldn't couldn't advance it at light load okay now do you remember from my discussion what what other business did Plessy come and start besides the engine company Pardon? Okay, besides the machine shop, not the little machine shop. <laughs> so that's that was it. Answer here. Yeah. Anyone want to hazard a guess? Uh, CRTI. <laughs> Did you say the fuel systems?
No, well, I guess I'm, I, that's not the answer I was looking for because that's really part of Cummins Inc. now. Oh. What's the answer, Okay, no, it was the it was the Jake break, Jacob's break. Okay, number three. Why is the code name for our new high horsepower engine Hedgehog? I know that. Hedgehog X Capital. <laughs> no. Did did you hear? Sasha's answer? Hedgehogs like to eat caterpillars? That's true, but that's not the reason. This, this is going to be a tough one. Though. Okay, I'll give you the answer. The, the answer is because uh, there was a management book, uh, I guess written by Jim Collins, and the book was called Good to Great. And I think a lot of our managers read this about how to how to turn a good business into a great one, and uh, and so it goes back to a parable about a fox and a hedgehog, and the fox had lots of ideas on how to, I guess, eat the hedgehog or catch the hedgehog, and so every day he would try a new way of uh, approaching this hedgehog. But every day the hedgehog had only one thing he knew to do, and that was, of course, I guess, to roll up in a spiny ball. But he did it well, and so the fox never got the hedgehog. Okay, and here's the Jacobs engine brake slide. The Classy L. Cummins division. Okay, well, any questions from CRTI then? Okay, go ahead. Okay, is the uh, is the question you know what how did the aneroid function? And and it's basically the AFC on today's PT pump. So so what it did, it, there was a a, a diaphragm, uh, an elastomer, a rubber diaphragm, and a spring. And okay. and so with low intake manifold pressure, the spring would move this diaphragm to one position, and the diaphragm was connected then to a, a variable area uh, passage, basically. I think it was a plunger with a port. So it just throttled the fuel. It just limited the, the fuel flow to the engine under low intake manifold conditions. Then as the intake manifold pressure built up, this, this diaphragm uh, you know the force of the of the boost pressure on the diaphragm could overcome the spring pressure, so it was like a proportional throttle controlled by boost pressure. And there's there's similar devices, for instance, on the Bosch distributor pumps. They have a little air fuel control or boost control, so. There was, you know, once turbocharging came became popular and fuel systems were still hydromechanical, there was a need to limit fueling uh, until the turbocharger boost had built up. Yeah, I mean, what I guess along those lines. You know what's been interesting to see 
not only in our industry, but of course the automobile industry as well. But when you have a long period of development, you know, the hardware keeps evolving to solve more and more problems. So we keep adding hydromechanical gizmos to to coax the performance that we need. You know, first now it's this fueling control, then it's timing control, uh, you know, maybe cold start control, uh, governing, all of that. And then once you get computer control, you know, you have to drop the temptation of using your bag of hydromechanical tricks to solve problems and strive for the most simple, durable, and functional mechanical components and let the computer and the sensors, you know, really get the performance you need. So, what you know, I've been able to see that transition where basically the the managers and the engineers, you know, they were so used to being able to solve problems with with mechanical designs that it was sort of hard to get this new mindset of uh, of, of approaching it differently and, and and using the power of the computer. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for your attention. Thank you. 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 Thank Thanks. Well, it's it's still pretty rough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, thank you.